Ruben Moss uh, is, uh, has been following this passion of the trolley system and trains here in Central and Western Maryland since childhood. Um, he is currently the president and curator of the Hagerstown and Frederick <coughs> Railway Historical Society and a member of the board of directors of the National Road Heritage Foundation, although I understand that he's about to become a member of the leadership team there as well, uh, incoming vice president, well done. Um, representing both organizations, he was responsible for overseeing the development and installation of many new exhibits and artifacts at the Boonesboro Trolley Museum throughout the past year. So please join me in welcoming Ruben. Thank you, thank you. So tonight I'm going to talk about the trolleys, more specifically how, when, why, and what they were. A lot of people are familiar with the fact that there were trolleys in the area, but a lot of people don't realize how extensive the system was and how important it was to our region. So I want to focus on those details as I talk to you tonight. I'll start with a poem that was published in the uh, Valley Register in Middletown on October 9th, 1896, about two weeks before trolleys finally came to that town. The poem read, at last, at last, the dream of years that racked our anxious brain, through night and day, through toil and rest, has not been dreamed in vain. We stand in wonderment and awe and gaze upon the sight, while in our hearts, there rolls a wave of rapturous delight. Long years we toiled with might and main, while hope turned to despair, to bring the iron horse across our, bear, uh, our valley dear and fair. And while we labored on and on our idol to obtain, behold, there sweeps across the land the magic trolley train. The iron horse is soon forgot, and when the trolley comes, and soon it rolls along our way and to the valley hums. It climbs Catoctin's lovely slope, sweeps down our valley side, and o'er the hills, and on to town the wondrous trolleys glide. This poem really spoke of the anticipation the entire region had, the coming of trolleys, and what they would do for this area. So I'm gonna start with talking about the why, where, and how, uh, more general details. Uh, I'll touch on where the line traveled as I talk, uh, but to put the formation of the system into a little more context, I'm going to go back decades before the railway began and mention that in 1811, by an act of Congress, the construction on a federally funded road westward from Cumberland was started. To connect to this road, several turnpikes were formed between Cumberland and Frederick, and then from there branched off to Baltimore and the District of Columbia. <laughs> Through this area, we know this road as the Old National Pike, today considered part of the National Road. The road served the communities with access to easier travel, the ability to transport goods to and from towns and into the bigger cities nearby. Stagecoaches and other uh, long distance travel brought patrons to hotels and businesses, even in the rapidly, especially in the rapidly growing communities of Middletown and Boonesboro. The relatively smooth road provided farmers a farther range for selling their goods, and teams of horses grew more frequent over the mountains. Some parts of the road had not yet been completed when a new form of transportation appeared in the nation, the railroad. The Baltimore, Ohio Railroad specifically was formed in 1828 with the ambitious goal of connecting the ports of Baltimore with the Ohio River. This railroad had actually considered traveling west through Frederick itself, but while the city would have allowed it, there was still some public distrust in this new mode of travel, and they found that there was a more level route along the Potomac River. Eventually, the westward route crossed the Potomac River at Harper's Ferry and continued through Martinsburg, but they had briefly considered using the branch they were building to Hagerstown as the main line instead, were they not able to cross the river. Frederick itself still had much to offer, and in 1831, the B&O built what is claimed by some to have been the world's first railroad branch line. 
an industrial area grew up along Carroll Creek. Around this station, you see here, this structure was replaced in 1910, only four years after this photograph was taken. In 1872, the Frederick and Pennsylvania Line Railroad, which later became part of the Pennsylvania Railroad, built tracks right down the center of East Street, connecting with the B&O Railroad Yard at that 1831 station. And they built their own freight and passenger stations in town. South of Frederick in 1891, the Baltimore, Ohio, began construction on what was to be known as the largest single railroad sorting yard in the country in a small community that had just renamed itself Brunswick. This had been little more than a whistle stop canal town since the railroad had passed through in 1834, and suddenly the railroad owned this entire community. And north of Frederick, the Western Maryland Railway had passed through the town of Mechanicstown, which soon would be renamed Thurmont, on its way to Hagerstown, which it reached in 1872. In 1887, another railroad was formed to connect to the Western Maryland and Thurmont, connecting it with the Revolutionary War era Catoctin Furnace only four miles away. This railroad was designed to transport materials to the furnace and iron away from the furnace, as well as finished goods, as well as workers and residents back and forth between the communities. This was known as the Monoxy Valley Railroad and originally operated with mule-drawn rail cars until 1898 when this and one other steam locomotive were purchased secondhand to travel the route. Over the mountain here in Hagerstown, there were so many road and railroad connections within just a few years, including the Western Maryland Railway, but also the Baltimore, Ohio, Norfolk and Western, and the Cumberland Valley Railroad, that on maps it appeared as if they were spokes in a wagon wheel, with Hagerstown as the hub. Today, that's why we call it the Hub City. Railroads were everywhere, and by the mid-1870s had taken away a significant percentage of the long-distance goods and passenger travel from the road. Cost of maintaining the road were high, and it began to fall into disrepair. Often, the repairs were being made by locals and area farmers, rather than the turnpike companies that had been formed to maintain this road, and were, and were actually collecting tolls for its upkeep. This didn't sit well with the people of Middletown, an area with abundant fertile farmland. They were at least eight miles and a mountain climb in every direction from the nearest railroad. This was as much as a full day's trip, depending on their horse team and cargo. They saw that farms closer to the rails were able to transport their goods to markets in even bigger cities than Frederick, and manufacturers could transport goods almost anywhere in the nation, as well as stores being able to receive goods much easier. This meant larger profits for everyone. So the people of the Middletown Valley started looking into how to get a railroad of their own. Now in 1886, this man, Frank Sprague, had not only, who had worked for Thomas Edison, and not only that, but had also improved on some of his electrical motor designs, began his own company with a focus on practical electric motors and electric railway applications. Not only Edison's designs, but other inventors from around the world, he took their ideas and improved upon them. Sprague's company constructed the first successful large-scale streetcar system in the world in Richmond, Virginia in 1888. This proved that not only could electric power be used to transport people and goods effectively, but also in Richmond, they proved that these electric rail cars could climb hills while cool cooling cargo, something that had been limited to cable cars like those in San Francisco. The residents of the valley learned of Sprague's Richmond Railway, and having hoped for truth and rumors of steam railroads over the years, decided to take matters into their own hands. In 1893, they founded their own railway company, and after three years of effort, they were able to start funding construction. Despite the Middletown funding and minimal support from the city of Frederick, it was actually Frederick where construction began on this railway. We see here one of the first trolleys that leave Frederick in the late 1890s. On August 22nd, service between Frederick and the top of Catoctin Mountain began. The trolley stopped at an open grassy area where the company would soon after 
purchased the land and found a resort community to attract passengers that they would name Braddock Heights. On the second day of operation to the Catoctin mountaintop, so many passengers rode the trolleys that they feared they wouldn't get them all back to the city before nightfall. So this 48-seat passenger car, number 10, one of only three trolleys the company had bought at that point, departed the top of the mountain with 110 passengers on board, including the entire board of directors. <laughs> after the trolley lost control soon after departing the summit, it crossed a tall trestle bridge and passed the area of South Clifton Road. It crashed, injuring many of the passengers. And if anybody's curious where the crash took place, it's believed that it was roughly around the area under the alternate 40 on ramp for I-70 today. It was reported that company president George William Smith, whose home was actually not too far from the crash site, never found his missing shoe. <laughs> While there were many injuries, the majority recovered. Unfortunately, one widow who was kept hospitalized for her injuries died about a week later. Following this hard learned lesson, the railway kept a relatively safe record for the rest of its years. Car 11 continued to operate the route. We see car 11 here climbing Braddock Heights. Car 10 was soon rebuilt and back in service. Despite the incident, riders continued to enjoy the climb to the top of the mountain, where picnic grounds around an observation tower that had been built a couple years before, uh, overlooking both Frederick and Middletown, uh, was well enjoyed. <coughs> On October 12th, the Great Frederick Fair of 1896 opened and was provided with a brand new trolley stop. The front gate welcomed 1,500 passenger fares on trolleys, one there three trolleys in the four days that the fair took place. Riding the trolley to the fair would become a tradition in both Frederick and Hagerstown for three decades. The trolleys finally reached Middletown, the town that had actually funded it, about a week later on October 21st. The trolleys didn't even enter the town though. Instead, residents complained they had to walk up a half mile steep hill to get to the trolley stop. This was uh, remedied a few months later when a new station was built behind the Lutheran church, the church you see in the photo there. <coughs> desiring more passenger service, the people of Middletown, or desiring more than passenger service, the people of Middletown had wanted the trolleys for transporting goods, especially farm goods out of town and products to and from town for shops. The third trolley purchase, number one, which you see here, was designed to both carry passengers and freight. Not only freight in a cargo compartment on board the trolley, but being able to pull pa uh, freight, small freight cars. This would later be going, this car would later go on to be known as Old Mike. It's seen here right along the National Pike. If you're familiar with Middletown at all, this is right over the little Cone Branch Park along the National Pike today. Less than a year after service began, the company found that freight in and out of Middletown was an even bigger business than they had predicted. The July 1897 Catoctin Clarion from Thermont reported that, quote, freight traffic is blooming up so successfully that the Frederick and Middletown Electric Railway Company have added two more flat freight cars to their rolling stock. This makes six and one box car, besides three passenger cars. By 1913, the company boasted ownership of over 60 freight cars and a freight yard capacity of 185 cars. By 1920, this number had decreased and their aged cars were no longer being exchanged with other railroads. 1898 saw the connection to the town of Myersville. Following Middletown's lead, the people of Myersville founded their own company and built track from their town to the point where this station was founded the edge of Middletown. They leased their track to the Frederick and Middletown <coughs> Railway in exchange for a portion of the revenue. <coughs> in 1905, this was one of the new trolleys purchased. This small snowplow was purchased in number three. <coughs> this photograph was taken at Braddock Heights and it shows that the trolley was used for freight as well as as a snowplow. And you can see two of the small flat cars that were purchased uh, that were mentioned in the Catoctin Clarion there, one loaded with bales of straw and one loaded with bags of 
uh, we coming from Middletown going to Frederick. Trolley systems were appearing nationwide between Sprague's Richmond Railway and the opening of the Frederick and Middletown Railway. Some larger cities had been using cable cars or rail cars pulled by horses, and many of these were adopting the new electric trolleys. It was just before construction of the Frederick and Middletown began that two men, William Jennings and Christian Lynch, both of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, saw an opportunity to begin a lucrative business by building a cheap electric trolley service for commuters in and around Hagerstown, and they founded the Hagerstown Railway Company. A few years before this, in 1891, the Martinsburg Street Railway had been formed, and within five years had gone out of business. So this trolley, this Martinsburg trolley you see here, became one of the Hagerstown Railway's first three trolleys. In addition to the three cars purchased from Martinsburg, the Hagerstown Railway also purchased several brand new trolleys, making their fleet over twice as big as Frederick's. By August 8th, two weeks before Frederick began taking trolleys to Braddock Heights, they were already running trolleys from Hagerstown to Williamsport. This was great use to the industry commuters and Williamsport residents alike. By September 5th of that year, the company was also operating a loop in the city. Trolley service from Hagerstown was extended through Funkstown and reached the town of Boonesboro in 1902. Seen here is the Boonesboro Trolley Station and the Trolley Shelter, which was, were constructed just a few years later. Boonesboro was known for its fruit exports, and local farmers were eager for a rail connection besides the nearby b &O Railroad in Keysville to transport cantaloupes, peaches, and raspberries into the city and to receive supplies. There were plans to continue this route to Antietam for Antietam tourists. It's unknown exactly why that line was never actually completed. While the shelter is gone, the station itself still exists as a small trolley station that was mentioned earlier on the original site. Hagerstown's efforts to expand their network continued and after purchasing the tracks between Myersville and Middletown from the people of Myersville, they began working on a new route over the mountain to connect to that town. Tracks were added, branching at a place near Beaver Creek known as Wagner's Crossroads, today the intersection of Beaver Creek Road and Route 66. Soon after, this station was constructed a little, in a little community about a mile away known as Smoketown, today known as Mount Lena. A power substation was originally planned for the top of the mountain, but eventually was added onto this building, where you can see it built onto the roof. That substation was one of many along the system that I'll uh, be talking about later. After crossing the mountain, the Hagerstown route, funded by stock sales under the paper company name of the Hagerstown and Myersville Railway Company, traveled down the middle of Main Street in Myersville and joined with the existing tracks there. December 1st, 1904 saw the first through service for trolleys from Hagerstown travel all the way to Frederick. The trip at one time could have taken passengers up to two days by horse-drawn wagon or an expensive all-day trip on the railroad. Today, uh, by trolley that day, they could take the trip in two hours. Hmm. In 1906, a line traveling north from Hagerstown through what is now Long Meadow Shopping Center, which you can see here, uh, the area around Long Meadow Shopping Center, was built. This view is looking north from Northern Boulevard with the distance house be distant house being uh, roughly the area of the Pennsylvania Dutch Market. Mm -hmm. That line continued north along Marsh Pike through several small communities, including Paramount, which you see here, and Reed before crossing the state line and eventually coming to Shady Grove, Pennsylvania. Here, passengers could transfer to trolleys of another company's line west to Greencastle and Cham Chambersburg or east to Waynesboro and the Western Maryland Railway's Penmar Park. The Chambersburg, Greencastle, and Waynesboro Street Railway was wide gauge while the Hagerstown and Frederick was standard gauge. Thus, the two companies' trolleys could not share each other's tracks. Back in Frederick County in 1907, 
This station was constructed at the terminus of a new branch line from Braddock Heights to Jefferson. While there was ample farm business available for this small line, the ultimate goal was actually to connect to Brunswick, where farmers from Loudoun County could sh in Virginia could uh, ship goods across the river and then went to trolleys to Frederick. Fearing competition while in the process of doubling the size of their railroad yard there, the Baltimore, Ohio forced the cancellation of this line beyond Jefferson. Despite the fact that the town of Brunswick actually already installed trolley track down their main street. For a while it said that Brunswick was listed as the only town that had trolley track but never a trolley. <laughs> that same year, 1907, the Washington, Frederick, and Gettysburg Railroad formed to take over the former Monocacy Valley Railroad. The Catoctin Furnace had closed in 1903, and there had been some attempt to make the route successful, but that had faltered. From 1898 to 1907, those two steam locomotives had replaced the mule-pooled cars. This is the other steam locomotive that served that line. But the Washington, Frederick, and Gettysburg was formed as a far grander venture. The goal was to connect Georgetown, outside the nation's capital, up to Gettysburg, through Frederick and Thurmont. Part of the new brand included the purchase of two of these 40-type steam locomotives, these small little things, from the New York Elevated Railway, which was in the process of converting their own trains to electric, as well as the coaches that you see here. But that idea was short-lived. The line was never connected north of Thurmont or south of Frederick. And so, two years later, after no progress, the Washington, Frederick, and Gettysburg was sold to the Frederick and Middletown Railway Company, which was in the process of combining all of their subsidiary companies under one name, the new name being the Frederick Railroad. In 1911 and 1912, trolley wires were installed over the tracks to Thurmont, among many other improvements, and all of the steam locomotives were retired, being replaced by electric trolleys. Seen here is the first scheduled trolley to travel between Frederick and Thurmont. That was a period of great investment for the company. By 1912, under the leadership of Emory Koblitz, the Frederick Railroad had spent $180,000 on infrastructure improvements, an equivalent to over $5.3 million today. This included building a new terminal, which you see here, freight station, and a trolley maintenance and painting facility down the road from that in Frederick. New stations were also built at Braddock Heights in Middletown, and waiting shelters were built along the route, as well as other track and bridge upgrades throughout the system. With the growth of the trolley system, and soon after the purchase of the Hagerstown Railway Company by the Frederick Railroad in 1912, the company found that it was in need of greater power output than the small power plants that had been built at Lee Street in Hagerstown and East Street in Frederick, as well as a little steam power plant along Hollow Creek in Middletown. In addition to the trolleys, the companies had started providing electrical service to residents along the route. Businesses and farms in the communities they served uh, also drove up the need for electrical generation in the area. The Frederick and Hagerstown Power Company was started in 1912 in order to construct this building, a new power plant along the Western Maryland Railway and security. This plant was completed and opened in 1913. And not long after the plant opened, the companies were officially merged into the Hagerstown and Frederick Railway Company. The Frederick officers maintained the control over the, the new system and while the plants that came about during that transition uh, no longer operates, the building still stands, as you see here. It also, uh, in addition to replacing the power along this trolley system, replaced the power systems along the CG and W Railway in Pennsylvania, the Chambersburg, Greencastle, Waynesboro. The red lines you see here are the completed Hagerstown and Frederick Railway routes that at its peak between 1912 and 1938. 87 and a half miles of passenger service, making it one of the largest rural trolley systems in the country. The railway was thriving, 
And had it not been for legal obstacles and the work of the newly formed State Roads Commission between 1908 and the early 1920s, which led to paved roads and better automobile travel, the system would have likely considered, continued expanding. Seen in orange, you can see some of the proposed extensions that were never constructed, including the line from Jefferson to Brunswick, from Boonesboro to Sharpsburg, and from West Washington Street here in Hagerstown all the way to Clear Spring. There had also been some suggestion of extending a line to Smithsburg as well, but that also was never complete. That also, that 87 and a half miles doesn't include the additional 26 miles of line added when the Hagerstown and Frederick purchased the Chambers Mercury Castle in Waynesboro in 1917. It was one of many companies acquired over that decade by the Hagerstown and Frederick as they expanded their electrical holdings, buying the company for their electrical customers rather than the trolley customers. Across both the Hagerstown and Frederick and the CGNW, a significant portion of fares sold for passengers traveling for recreation. On the CGNW, the trolley served the community's Cold Spring Park in Waynesboro, or the company's Cold Spring Park in Waynesboro, as well as climbing the mountain to serve Western Maryland Railway's famous Penmar Amusement Park. Between passengers riding to these parks and the regular commuters, the CGNW boasted over 2 million fares sold in its peak year. Hagerstown and Frederick riders around Hagerstown could take, take both trolley systems to Penmar Park, while Frederick passengers could ride to Thurmont and climb aboard a Western Maryland railway train there to get to Penmar. The three companies offered a joint ticket for this purpose known as the Loop Trip. Before construction of the Frederick and Middletown Railway had begun, a three-story observation tower that I mentioned earlier had been built at the top of Kentucky Mountain. This overlooked both Frederick and Middletown, and around this, the railway built its own amusement park at Braddock Heights with a theater, a carousel, a skating rink, dance hall, miniature train ride, arcade, and many other rides and activities over the years. At one time, even a retired trolley was placed in the playground. The large building seen in this photo was the casino building. It was given that fancy name because it had games inside, but there was no gambling that took place. It was the last surviving structure, best known today as the Braddock Heights Roller Rink, which was lost to arson in 1998. See a few of the tickets from our collection for some of the rides here. <laughs> wow. The Hagerstown Railway also served a privately owned amusement park in Funkstown for many years. Its entrance was just across the creek, the creek from the town. From 1920 until 1925, the railway owned and operated that park as well. This would be a trolley passenger's view of the entrance when it was called Woodley Park. It also went under the names Electric Park and uh, Watts Park. And as I mentioned before, trolleys became a fair tradition for many years. Fair month meant a drastic increase in ridership with as many as 36 trolleys operating from each city square to their respective fare during fair week, <laughs> departing one trolley per minute. At its peak in the early 1920s, the Hagerstown and Frederick registered almost 3.8 million passengers in one year. A large number of those passengers were going to either of the fairs or one of the amusement parks, and a portion were being student or students riding to high schools in the city. That year, the fairs at in Hagerstown and Frederick actually exceeded both of Baltimore's separate streetcar companies combined. By that year, the Hagerstown and Frederick Railway was also connecting electrical customers as far south as Front Royal, Virginia, as far east as Mount Airy, Maryland, north as Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, and as far west as Frostburg. In addition to generating the power, the company offered electricians to install wiring into houses that had none, they would install the lighting and outlets into your home or business, or even into your barn. They all provided home services division, which opened storefronts and hired women to sell the latest electrical appliances, which you could get delivered by trolley. If you lived along the line, you could order a brand new Westinghouse waffle iron in 1915, have it delivered by the railway, 
and then pay the railway for the power to use it. With all of these electrical customers, and despite the high peak ridership and the heavy freight service the railway was providing, the company was actually making 67% of their income off of their electrical services. Because of this, they decided to reorganize and the Hagerstown and Frederick Railway Company, while they kept that name for railway operations, became a name on paper only, while the corporate entity became the Potomac Public Service Company in 1922. That year, construction began when the company's new flagship power plant at Williamsport, the plant that would control all the other power plants. The modern design contrasted with the rather primitive looking CNO Canal and the nearby original Hagerstown Railway brick power plant, today known as the trolley barn. The new coal plant would provide the core power for the electrical system in the area and would be expanded multiple times during almost 90 years of operation. Not long after the Hagerstown and Frederick became the, public, the Potomac Public Service Company, they acquired another power network in Cumberland which owned that, one of that city's local streetcar systems. The Edison Electric Illuminating Company had recently rebranded into a shorter name, one that the Potomac Public Service Company decided would be better for marketing. So they took that name for themselves, and that is how the Hagerstown and Frederick Railway Company became known as the Potomac Edison Company. In the 1920s and 1930s, trolley systems across the country were closing down en masse. And those that survived, such as these seen in Baltimore and San Francisco, were evolving to compete with the ever-improving automobile and the new automotive bus services. New streetcar designs with center doors became popular to speed loading and unloading, notably Peter Witt-style cars in the 1920s and the streamlined President's Committee cars, or PCC cars, in the 1930s, which are what you just saw traveling through the streets. Modern streamlined looks and faster service were becoming standard for trolley systems in cities across the country. But this car, number 171, crossing Rosemont Avenue into Hood College around 1946, this was the newest car the Hagerstown and Frederick Railway ever bought. No Peter Witt car or PCC car would ever run on the Hagerstown and Frederick tracks. The last trolley purchased new and kept was bought two years after uh, 171, this is number 172. It was bought in 1921. And that is the fastest, and the fastest and most modern trolleys to ever operate on the route had been similarly traditionally looking trolleys built for Cumberland in 1926 and moved to Hagerstown and Frederick in 1934. The common trolleys used on every route of the Hagerstown and Frederick were 40 to 48 passenger combination cars of various banks. The same type that Frederick's old Mike had been. <laughs> These offered the ability to transport less than carload freight, or less than what you'd need a boxcar for. Express parcels and baggage in a compartment separate from the passengers without needing additional train cars. Unlike some city or high-speed systems, the entire railway was single track, with strategically placed sidings and passing tracks where the trolleys would pull over to allow opposing trolley cars or freight trains to go by. Each route came to an end with no turnaround loop, requiring a trolley pole with a wheel on the end to be raised or lowered at the end of each trip. That way, the pole that was raised was always traveling behind the trolley in contact with the overhead wire collecting the electricity from that wire to power the trolley. Most of these passing sidings, as well as some of the passenger shelters, were equipped with phones where crews could communicate with the dispatcher. At some point in later years, they also started using the normal uh, train orders like the larger railroads. In 1932, the Chambersburg Greencastle and Waynesboro Street Railway was closed. And with that line connecting Shady Grove to Hagerstown, uh, not needing as many passengers, that closed as well. 
Several of the CGW trolleys were moved to the Hagerstown and Frederick and put on wheels salvaged from older Hagerstown and Frederick cars. While the company had a relatively safe record after that 19, 1896 wreck, and very few fatalities and collisions, uh, considering the limited safety features railways offered at that time, minor collisions between trolley and road vehicle or even trains at railroad crossings would occasionally happen. But as Frederick had begun service with a severe crash, the twilight years of the main line also were shadowed by a similar incident. On January 26, 1936, former CGNW car number 35 was operating on the main line heading west. This is car 35 when it was serving on the CGNW. As it descended the western slope of South Mountain around 6.10 p.m., Motorman Clyde Wachtel lost control of the car and was unable to slow the combine. Just before a sharp turn in a road crossing, the motorman jumped free of the car in time to avoid the impending disaster. The trolley ripped itself from its wheels and crashed into a waiting shelter known as Reese, right along what's now Crystal Falls Drive. It continued sliding nearly 100 feet before coming to a stop. Witnesses at the nearby Mount Lena station reported the pair of wheels flying past the station at high speed, sparking as they went. One witness described it as a pair of dogs chasing each other down the mountain. Eventually, they came to a stop almost a mile away from the wreck. The sole passenger on board, a warehouse employee and an extra trainman named George Victor Fraley. Fraley had been visiting his mother at the Tocken Furnace that day and didn't jump clear of the car in time. He was killed instantly. This is Mr. Fraley in his H&F uniform. Both men's families had considered joining them for the trip that day, but by chance had each decided against coming for different reasons. Just shy of three years later, on October, in October of, 18, of 1938, trolley service ended between Myersville and Funkstown. The last car to travel the line was car number 172, <coughs> heading westbound to Hagerstown, with virtually no fanfare, as if it was a normal trip. The closure was for safety reasons, but not because of the past incidents, but rather the fact that the state of Maryland wanted to build a bypass for the original Baltimore National Pipe with a newer, straighter road, which we today know as Route 40. This would have crossed the railway at seven places, four of those being on the slope of the mountain, and they knew that would be asking for disaster. And so the closure of the main line also ports the closure of the Boonesboro branch line. Seen here is car number 150 returning from Boonesboro in the early 1930s along Route 66. This view is basically taken looking from the entrance to the sheets on 40 and 66. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cars 150 to 153 were purchased secondhand in 1923 from the Columbia Railway Gas and Electric Company in Columbia, South Carolina. They were assigned primarily to Boonesboro and Funkstown service. After the closure, they were moved to Frederick, but were sold for scrap within a few months. Their builder, Curly A. Thomas Car Works, is significant as these cars were built in 1917 from an earlier and slightly smaller design that was used to later build the famous New Orleans streetcars five years later. Today, only 150 survives out of that series, and the company itself still exists building school buses. Car 151, its sister car, and motorman Lester Smith were last to operate out of Boonesboro. We see here on the last day of service. This is about a block away from the trolley station on that last trip back to Hagerstown. By now, the company had been investing in all of the local bus services. They owned both local and had started a regional bus company. And trolley tickets that were still valid would be valid on those buses between Boonesboro and Hagerstown until they expired. City Loop Service, which had served both cities since 1896 
and it operated since the teams using these single truck near side cars had stopped in the late 1920s, also being replaced by buses. In Frederick County, Myersville became the end of the line once more. And this would last until 1945 when the need for more track maintenance and the need for additional power in Frederick for a uh, army facility led to the abandonment of the line between Middletown and Myersville in favor of the war effort. Frederick remained busy after the main line closure. While the company would never again see as many passengers as they had seen in the 1920s, there were still occasionally full cars during the 1940s, especially in the mornings and evenings when students rode the cars to school. In Hagerstown, only four trolleys were left in service. Three of the combines, numbers 168, 169, and 172, and one Hagerstown built maintenance trolley, number eight. Despite the increase, the company began to sell their trolleys as they grew too old and worn out to be cost effective to maintain, resulting in fewer and fewer trolleys riding the rails. With gas rationing beginning during World War II, there was an uptick in riders, but it still wasn't enough to justify a drastic increase in passenger service. The war did, however, bring a drastic increase to freight service. The railway served over 20 industries in Frederick, with direct sidings as well as being the only rail interchange with the one base U.S. Army Railway at Fort Detrick. In 1945, the Army constructed a scrap metal salvage facility directly alongside the h and tracks on the edge of Frederick and contracted that to the railway to bring vehicles and scrap metal salvaged from the war fields to their Frederick facility via the Western Maryland and Thermont. During the war, it was a common sight to see electric freight motors, or on rare occasion, the Fort Detrick diesel locomotive, <coughs> pulling trains loaded with damaged army tanks, airplanes, and other salvaged material through the streets of Frederick. This included both ally and access, access materials alike. Occasionally, gondolas loaded with damaged helmets brought solid reminders of the dangers facing the troops overseas. The increase in freight operations led to the purchase of several new freight units and locomotives, including a box cab from the Washington Old Dominion Railway that you see in the center here, which began life as a freight car. A 52-foot-long former Baltimore and Annapolis freight motor, which is seen parked behind it, which was the largest motor to run on the Hagerstown and Frederick Railway system, and two electric steeple clad locomotives, which you can see one of the steeple cabs to the left here. Washington County continued to see trolley operation through the war between West Washington Street and Williamsport until August 4th, 1947, when the last three trolleys left the square and deposited dignitaries and special guests in Williamsport. There, groups posed with the trolleys and with the brightly colored buses that were replacing them. The buses took everyone back to Hagerstown to inaugurate the beginning of the new bus service. The three trolleys sat in Williamsport for a day before being dragged empty and parked at, along Wilson Boulevard, waiting to be sold for scrap value. However, 171 was saved, or 172 was saved. Jefferson service had ended in the mid-1940s, and it would not be long after, and only one month after the Hagerstown service ended, that Middletown and Braddock Heights service would end. Like Hagerstown, the closures were forced by the creation of one-way streets on the roads that the trolleys had traveled in both directions for many years. Car 172 had been the last trolley to leave Hagerstown officially, and was moved to Frederick to replace two trolleys that had been damaged in a wreck. A cowardly wreck at that. It was still wearing the faded last trolley in Washington County paint that they had tried to scrape off and couldn't remove. You can make out some of it right there. When it took the last passengers from Middletown to Frederick. Day after the end of service, I just learned today, a group of rail fans convinced the railway to let them take one last trip to Braddock Heights and back, and they put a sign on the front of the trolley saying it was a funeral train. <laughs> By the 1950s, 172, uh, car 172, which was built in 1921, 
and its 1919 built sister car 171 were the only two passenger trolleys left operating when any of the Hagerstown and Frederick tracked. So both traveled back and forth between Frederick and Thurmont, passing each other around the halfway point in Lewistown, which you see here. Despite being the last two cars, one or the other would still occasionally be rented by rail fan groups wishing to take a, a day to ride the trolley around the area as a group. These groups would occasionally uh, convince the railway to let them stop, get off, and take photographs of the trolleys. This practice had been common for decades, and it's the source of many of the existing photographs of the Hagerstown and Frederick that we have today. What you see here are four different photographs taken at almost the same time by different photographers on the same day in the 1930s, 1939. One group even tried to save the system as a tourist railway when the company had requested of the state permission to close passenger service permanently. But their bid was not enough, and on February 20th, 1954, both trolley cars left the Frederick shops together on one final trip. On the way back, students at Cliff College presented the company president, R. Paul Smith, with flowers and sang songs in tribute to the trolleys. The right of way had crossed through the campus since the beginning of the school's existence at that site. And for many decades, students had been riding the trolleys to school and to school picnics at Braddock Heights aboard the trolley. Bus service replacing the interurban route began that same morning, but was too abandoned only a year later. Freight service on the route between Frederick and Thurmont continued after passenger service ended, and freight trains continued to rumble down Fifth Street in Frederick. Because of the creation of the one-way streets, it had isolated the railway's trains from customers on South Street. It was only during that time from 1947 until 1958 that the street trackage down East Street that people often mistaken for trolley track was used by the trolleys. That was the Pennsylvania Railroad track, but they made an agreement to run trolley wire over the tracks for those years to reach their customers in South Street. By 1956, the electric freight motors that had been purchased during the war and some that had been serving since 1920 had been replaced by two ex-US Army Whitcomb diesel locomotives. Every bus company had been sold off by that time and tracks around Thermont were removed in 1958. Any remaining freight sidings being served by these two diesel locomotives were sold in 1961, and Potomac Edison officially got out of the railroad business. Now I'm gonna go over some of the impacts this railway had on the area. And uh, this is sort of an excuse to show you more photos. <laughs> when constructed, the trolley system in Central Maryland provided a connection between communities and people that was desperately needed. For the prospect of increased ridership, the company would often promote social activities and festivals, which brought people together and helped to build communities. The railway and electrical system also provided hundreds of jobs in the area and helped to boost the economies in every community it served. And what you see here is an advertisement on one of the trolleys, it's actually on both sides, advertising a baseball game at the fairgrounds <laughs> in Hagerstown Square. When the company began, consumer electricity was a relatively new technology. While there were a few small power suppliers in the region, it was the railway which ultimately introduced the public to electrical power. The Hagerstown Railway Company was the first provider of power to light electric street lights in the city of Hagerstown before the city built its own municipal light power plant. Across the county, uh, across the country, some agricultural communities didn't have access to electricity until the 1930s, and in some cases even the 1950s. But in Central Maryland, dozens of farms and communities were given the opportunity to use electric lights, electric motors, and electric power in their lives as early as the late 1890s. Both city and interurban trolley services provided more opportunities and a better life for area residents. It wasn't cheap, and there were still many families that couldn't afford to take the trolley regularly. 
But for most, it was cheaper and faster than trying to use a horse-drawn wagon or take a stagecoach or purchase one of the early automobiles to travel on the bumpy roads. The system gave rural families easier access to better paying jobs in towns and cities, and families could travel into the city for a wider variety of goods and services and food products than they could at their local markets. Students were offered discounted and later school board subsidized fares to ride to high school or college classes that for many without an automobile were too far away to attend, which expanded educational opportunities for rural families into the mid 1940s when school bus service became standard. In a time when even automobiles were open to the weather and uncomfortable, trolleys normally offered a relatively smooth and luxurious ride, as long as you could tolerate some noise and a steady rocking back and forth. For many families who would rarely visit friends and family in other communities because of the time, distance, and trouble to manage horses or children, they could cross the county to make a visit and still get home before the day was over. Work commuters found the cars reliable and safe, and only occasionally was there a car late for its schedule. The crews, conductors, and motormen knew every regular passenger by name, and many passengers knew their regular motorman well. I've even spoken to people who rode as children to school who would fall asleep on the trolley on the way home and the motorman would stop, get up, and wake them up to make sure they got their stop. The interchange with the Western Maryland Railway, the, the Monoxy Valley Railroad, it started in 1887, remained an important part of the railway until the end of service. Here, an interurban car would meet all of the Western Maryland passenger trains stopping in Thermont, traveling in either direction. At these meetings, the two would exchange passengers and their luggage. In the cities, for a time, the electric car would also employ porters and pick up passengers at the hotels to be carried to the area railroad stations or to Thermont so that they had a seamless transition on their journey, journey out of the area to anywhere in the country. For a time, even goldfish raised in Lewistown and trout being sent across the state of Maryland to stock fishing ponds and waterways were shipped by trolley to Thermont to be carried by the Western Maryland baggage cars to their destination. Express packages and U.S. mail were also exchanged between train and trolley. These were the days before UPS and FedEx, so the railway partnered with the American Railway Express to transport packages to people's homes. If you purchase goods or furniture in the city and live near the line, the motorman would at times even deliver the furniture right to your door. <coughs> Much like today's parcel services, the station allowed people to easily ship their packages out or receive them from anywhere in the country. This merchandise check is an example, tracked the February 10th, 1899 shipment of a package along the four or five miles from halfway to Williamsport. Must have been something heavy because at that time it cost 30 cents to ship that package. There was also the freight interchange yard with the Western Maryland Railway at Thermont. The freight business which grew out of this relationship in the very early years of the Frederick Railroad helped to keep the trolley in service much longer than it otherwise would have just as a passenger service. Farms and industries throughout the region would ship goods by trolley, and the connection with the Western Maryland Railway here, as well as smaller interchanges with the Western Maryland and BNL elsewhere, allowed them direct access to shipping or receiving both carloads and less than carload quantities of freight. Freight service was not limited to Thermont or the cities though. Frederick built number five is seen here in this image with a freight train in Middletown. While often thought of in Frederick, Number five and several of the other freight motors were, that were used by the company were also seen across the entire system. There are several photos of this trolley also in Hagerstown. In Funkstown, the railway would collect flour and would drop off coal at the local flour mill and exchange them with the B&O Railroad along Wilson Boulevard in Hagerstown. The freight had a great impact on the valley farmers in the Middletown Valley with their ability to send and receive goods, as I've already mentioned a little bit, but this September 25th, 1899 Waybill 
shows that a farm near Middletown purchased six and a quarter tons of fertilizer from a fertilizer company in Frederick, which del was delivered on one rail car. Car number 18. This likely took less than half an hour to transport from the city to Middletown. Four years before this date, that trip would have taken several horse teams or several days to transport in seven to 10 hour trips over the mountain. Even after selling off the majority of their worn out freight equipment in the late teens and early 1920s, the company maintained a collection of some of the older freight cars, which they used within the system to transport their own material as well as goods from towns into the city. Two of these cars can be seen here at Mount Lena, where local stores and farmers could load or receive large quantities of goods by rail rather than thin wagon. Being standard gauge, the railway was of course capable of interchanging any type of freight car owned by businesses and railways anywhere in the country. For agricultural communities, this meant the availability of refrigerated boxcars to transport produce and dairy products. One creamery in Middletown is recorded as having rented a refrigerator car for over a decade from a company in Wisconsin. With this car, they made a weekly shipment of Mid Middletown Valley butter to Baltimore, where it was sold for a much higher price than it would have been sold for in Frederick. In Boonesboro, the cantaloupes and raspberries and peaches were often exported in bulk, though they were more often shipped in the baggage compartment of the interurban combines where sudden stops of the car were known to topple crates and roll the melons under the feet of passengers. <laughs> Even livestock could be transported with the trolleys, if needed. Either with livestock rail cars, as seen here with one of the freight engines purchased by the Frederick Railroad in 1910, or sometimes in the trolleys themselves, when at least one occasion, the company transported a single calf in the vestibule with the, in the interurban car's motorman. And we cannot forget the railway's responsibility for the founding of the community of Braddockites in 1896. While designed to be a resort town for city tourists and, in and increase in urban revenues, this town still exists. We also should not forget the creation of one of the nation's early luxury streetcar suburbs known as Airview, now part of Middletown, which it was built outside of. And let us not forget that in its earliest days, the railway helped to shape the landscape of other communities in the area. The presence of rails determined the placement of sidewalks, fences, and even new roads as they were being constructed. Today, public improvement product projects are frequently removing some of these landmarks from the trolley era, but a few still remain. Which leads me to the final part of my presentation tonight, what remains to be seen for those who know where to look. Nearly 70 years have passed since the last passenger interurban left Frederick, yet a keen eye can still find remnants of the line across the entire system. Much of the right-of-way actually does remain visible, while the wording of deeds returned most of the route to the original owners. Though the power company does maintain easements in many areas, because nearly every original pole line still remains in use. Even the berm, the raised stone and dirt mound that the trolley tracks were built on, along portions of the main line over South Mountain, can be seen despite abandonment eight decades ago. While none of the bridge decks, the steel that supported the railroad tracks over waterways remain, many of the supports still do. Although growth and decay sometimes makes it difficult to find them without some searching. This is actually the exact same view as the previous photo. If you look really closely, you can see the concrete is still. Nearly a dozen structures survive from the system as well. The Frederick Car Barn, which was built around 1910, is today the back warehouse of Potomac Edison's line maintenance building in Frederick. The street facing side where all the doors seen in historic photos full of trolleys now are hidden with a more modern office addition. The Hagerstown car barn, which began as a power plant in 1898, the first power plant 
to generate power for the city of Hagerstown survives as well. It was modified heavily and expanded with offices added where the original boiler room had been and a large open space where the trolleys were once parked outside added to maintain the buses for the city and for Blue Ridge Line Bus Company. And of course, the trolley. The car barn still stands along Summit Avenue, now only a couple blocks from the city's new baseball stadium that's under construction. The building still contains one of the original inspection pits and some other pieces of trolley maintenance equi equipment built into the ceiling. In 1907, this was the station built to serve Jefferson. Today, it's a storage, it is storage for a feed, uh, feed store, and the waiting room has been minimally modified to serve as a little uh, local art shop known as the Main Street Trolley. Braddock Heights once had two stations, the station at the base of the amusement park survives. It was built as a post office station, offices, and the power substation, as well as a store. It replaced the original amusement park station that, during the 1910 to 1912 upgrades. Today it survives until recently as a liquor store, uh, and it still is an apartment building. It's under new ownership, and I'm told may become a cafe. Now used as a business with the front and side entrances bricked up, the 1919 built Myersville station still exists as well. It was attached to a people's general store and can be easily found by a row of columns facing the street. A station sign showing the distances to Frederick and Hagerstown still hangs above the original entranceway. The park beside this station was the site of the town's freight station and today features the only surviving Frederick and Middletown era waiting shelter. This shelter was originally located in a rural area a few miles east, where the structure was the namesake for present day Station Road. Frederick's terminal station stands today as well. This was where all the interurban cars leaving the city boarded passengers. A track ran inside the center of the building serving a freight warehouse and indoor freight platform uh, that was accessed through the rear section and originally a tr the track extended through the front serving passengers in the middle of the building uh, but that was later boarded up in the uh, 1920s eventually passengers boarded the thermon on this side of the street, uh, building as you can see here and in the middle of carroll street if they were heading to hagerstown or middletown the structure is better known by local residents today as the old Frederick News Post building and is planned to become a restaurant as part of a uh, future hotel proposed for the area. Most of the routes the trolleys took through farmland still bear power lines. The right of way itself now worked into fields, but the poles stand as the markers. Slowly, the construction of developments is beginning to shift uh, some of these paths to different alignments. But as you can see, for some of the rural areas, not much has changed. Several of the substations along the route, which were originally spaced about two miles apart to convert generated AC power into the 600 volts of DC power the trolleys were running on, are still in use. Over the years, these have been upgraded, expanded, maybe moved next door or down the road. Uh, but many of the buildings also still survive. Seen here is the Yellow Springs substation. The stone structure here once contained a switch that a neighbor was paid by the railway to flip each morning to turn the power on for the trolleys. This is the same spot in 1953 as uh, the previous modern image. You can see that stone structure behind the little waiting shelter right there. So there's the, the, state, the structure that still stands. Car 171, perhaps one of the most photographed of all the trolleys, and one of the last two interurban cars to operate a revenue schedule in the mid-Atlantic, still survives as a private cabin north of Frederick. It is one of four survivors. Sister car 168, the first of that model of custom steel-bodied interurban cars built by J.G. Grill Company of Philadelphia, was the first of the three last trolleys to leave Hagerstown. 
It is preserved at the Hagerstown Roundhouse Museum. The museum hopes to someday provide it with a desperately needed cosmetic restoration wow. yeah. as it's suffering some structural damage now from its age of well over 100 years. Car 150, that early Curly Thomas car, and the design ancestor to the New Orleans car that served the Boonesboro and Funkstown routes out of Hagerstown, can now be found inside of the Myersville Community Library, where guests can sit inside the car and enjoy a peaceful book or study. Next time you see a school bus that says Thomas above the door or on the nose, think of this trolley because they have the same ancestor. And freight motor number five, built in Frederick in 1920 out of spare parts and lumber. One of the primary workforces of the railway which remained in operation for 35 years and could pull several freight cars, as well as essentially being a self-propelled boxcar by itself, can be found along the Thurmont Trolley Trail at the site where the H&F Railway's main street station in Thurmont once stood, only a block away from the old Western Maryland tracks. Like so many other systems in the country, new highways and availability of cars, trucks, and buses ultimately led to the end of trolleys in Central Maryland. But their legacy remains. Today, people still pay their power bill to Potomac Edison. The company may have changed a lot over the years, but for some, the name still conjures up memories of green and cream rail cars and the sound of grinding gears. The trolleys of the past may be gone, and more, than, more decades may have passed now than had seen trolley operation in our area. Yet so many today continue to look back fondly at a different time, a time when the Hagerstown and Frederick trolleys crossed our countryside and made a lasting impact on the people and neighborhoods <laughs> that shape our past and our future. I thank you for coming out tonight. Well done. Now, as usual, there are usually questions, so, yes, sir. When was the last trolley that went up Braddock Heights? Was it the early 40s or mid-40s? It was 47. 47. 47. Uh, it would have uh, been September 30th, 1947. <laughs> I knew two ladies at school on that trolley. Oh, really? Yeah. Anyone else have any questions? Yes, sir. A uh, big building in Mount Lena that you showed, is that yes. still there? The platform is all that remains, and you have to know where you're looking because you can't find it unless you are mm -hmm. on top of it. Uh, but it, the, the platform and part of the foundation is still there, as well as the roof that held the substation. You can still find the brackets where all of those poles were attached to, but it basically flattened. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes? Were you able to prove that uh, Concrete Five Pool on Head Road was actually part of the rail there? There are no definitive records. But the fact that it is right along the trolley line and there are similar uh, concrete blocks along the line that were used, um, I would be very surprised if it wasn't. So you don't think the plaque would ever be placed there? I feel like it would be worth it uh, if somebody was willing to, to fund putting a plaque there. Uh, it would be a, a good spot for one because that is an interesting location yeah. and worth preserving. Are there any other questions? Yes. Uh, the rail, the Civil War rail trail that's been proposed off and on from Hagerstown to South County, uh, is that somehow connected with the trolley system? I'm not familiar with that particular trail. I mean, there are a lot of trails that I have followed. Um, mm. It's unlikely, but it's possible that there might be a few crossings. It's not. It's, it's, it's part. It's part of the unit of the Hagerstown. Oh, okay. It's not. Okay. It's so it's the, that was the BNO. Okay. So that, that okay. answers that question. That was the BNO route. That was the one that almost became the main line if they had not crossed Harpers Ferry. Wow. Yes. There was a local attorney, Hagerstown attorney named George Stein, who had a clubhouse out in the Dan Lincoln Park. Mm -hmm. And my understanding was that at one time. He had a problem, part of the problem, 
as part of that car pack, whatever the theme of. That is that is the car that's at the Roundhouse Museum. Very uh, cool. When the National Park Service started buying the, the buildings that were along the canal and demolishing them, uh, they offered them to the Hagerstown Model Railroad Museum, which at the time was at the fairgrounds. And so Potomac Edison actually provided the labor to help chip away the building from the trolley that had been built around. They moved it to the fairgrounds, uh, left it there for several years, and then the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, it got moved to the Roundhouse Museum where it now resides. What number was that? 168. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. My uh, photograph has a moved. Okay. So what, what year was that? Do you remember, Randy? Uh, I might have a little slide. Okay. So I started it after when they took it all to Spain, up at the site down along the river, the whole way into the bus stop in Hagerstown. Because I chased it on Interstate 70. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yes. So the car was outside the Arizona Rail, uh, uh, Railway Museum. Mm -hmm. What are they estimating in terms of the cost of the fare that? They, they haven't even reached that point. Basically, they've been trying to get the funds to do a study to see uh, what it needs, but it has uh, it has some, some rock, some issues that are in desperate need of attention. So they, uh, they definitely do need the funds to do the study to see what needs done to stabilize it. Yes. Are there any of the power trucks left anywhere in the world? There were rumors that Baltimore Streetcar Museum might have had one, but they don't know anything about that. Uh, so there, it's unlikely that any still exist. They probably all went to scrap. Uh, there are similar trucks around the world. Uh, if you know where to look, uh, I know Japan still uses cars that use similar power trucks, so it's possible to find the correct trucks for a few of the cars, uh, but it's very uh, cost prohibitive unless you're really working with a good funding source and planning to actually get it running. Uh, otherwise, they've just been sitting on freight car trucks. Well, if there are no more questions, I thank you all. I'll be here for a little while longer if you think of anything else. Uh, if you haven't already, there are brochures in the back table for the Hagerstown and Frederick Railway Historical Society and information about the Boonesboro Trolley Station Museum. Um, our organization provides quarterly newsletters, uh, preserves photos like this. We're always looking for members to show support and volunteer. Uh, so thank you for coming. And